Okay, hello everyone. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about critical appraisal. I am Maureen Babb. I'm Nicole. And yeah, we'll just get started. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat box or if you're watching later, you can email us any follow-up questions that you have. Um, so to begin, uh, we're going to cover a couple of different things in this seminar. So we're going to briefly introduce the WRHA Virtual Library, who we are, what we can do for you. We're going to describe when critical appraisal of information should be used. We're going to identify some critical appraisal tools and techniques, and we'll go through them. And we're going to indicate where you can learn more about critical appraisal, because this is, in fact, an enormous topic that we can't possibly hope to cover in half an hour. And uh, so without further ado, we'll get started. Um, so the WRHA Virtual Library, that's who we are, that's your library. Um, we provide electronic access to resources uh, for WRHA staff, eligible community health agencies, and eligible personal care homes. Uh, we provide these electronic resources. We also provide library services such as literature searches, document delivery, and education and training sessions, including this one. Um, though the education and training sessions of this sort that we post up freely can be watched by anybody. You don't actually have to work at the WRHA Virtual Library to do so. So uh, we're going to cover sort of a basic introduction to what critical appraisal is. You can see it here in sort of the search development research process kind of thing. Um, so we'll go through what it is, and then we'll go through some basic techniques. We've picked out a few of our favorites, but once again, it is a huge topic, and if this is something that you're interested in, which you should be, <laughs> um, uh, we'd encourage you to follow up some of those resources to get a much more robust, uh, much more robust insights into the topic. So what is critical appraisal? Um, it's a careful assessment of a resource, uh, and there's in general, it should be transparent, systematic, and careful methods. Um, we'll go through some of those. We do understand, though, that, of course, everybody's busy and that sometimes you need to do slightly less intensive critical appraisal, but you should also you should always be doing some sort of critical appraisal of any resource that you're looking at, whether or not it's one of the validated, very structured uh, appraisals or whether it's something just more simple to make sure that you're paying attention to what you're actually looking at to make sure that you can tell that it's good quality or not. So we're going to talk about contextual considerations because something that's important for one study may not be important for another. We're going to talk about in external considerations. We're also going to talk about internal validity and we're going to talk about bias. Um, and I sort of think of the, the less intensive versions is critical appraisal light. Um, so you should at the very least be doing critical appraisal light of everything that you're doing. Um, so where it fits in research and practice, it's a key component of both research and practice. As I've said a couple of times now, you should be considering it every time. You should be incorporating critical appraisal into your practice to make sure that the information that you're providing is accurate and valid and is worth providing at all. Um, so again, we've got this little map where it fits in. So you've done your search, you do an appraisal, then you can do a synthesize, adapt, implement, evaluate, define, begin your new search and that sort of thing. Um, so let's start with trustworthiness of information. So one of the things that you want to do is consider the source. You've got your blog post versus your peer reviewed articles. And it's not that blog posts are necessarily terrible, but in general, peer reviewed articles are going to be of a higher quality. Medline, which is a, a curated database, is generally going to be higher quality than what you find on Google. Now, is this an appropriate shortcut, i.e. is everything you find on Medline going to be good? Well, no. no. <laughs> so poor quality information absolutely uh, gets through peer review, gets into subscription databases. And so this is part of why you can't just use, oh, it's in Medline as a shortcut for, oh, it's good. You need to be doing this assessment every time. Um, and if you feel like being sort of depressed and seeing how often this gets through, you can check out Retraction Watch, um, which is a website that highlights 
studies that have been retracted either for poor quality information, for inappropriate methods, for, well, really anything like that. Um, so you can get a sense of how much some of the information that looks like it should be good quality is still getting past peer review and still getting into subscription databases. Um, but, you know, there there is, in general, Medline is still going to have higher quality information than Google, and peer-reviewed articles are generally going to be higher quality than blog posts, but it's not the, you still need to do critical assessment. So, um, we're going to go through some different tools and techniques. We're going to start off with some of the simpler ones, which maybe you've seen before, and we're going to start with external assessment. So paying attention to factors outside of the resource itself, and then we'll move on to internal consistency. Uh, so one of the simplest ones that you've maybe heard about before is the CRAP test, which was originally developed by Molly Bistrom and Kenneth Orenic at uh, Dominican University in Illinois. Um, and it's relatively straightforward. So uh, the C stands for currency. So how recent is the information? And importantly, how much does that, uh, the recency of the currency of the information, how much does it matter for your topic? So it's often quite important in health, but if you're doing something more in the history of medicine, well, maybe it doesn't matter if you've got a source from 1920. In fact, maybe it's helpful for you to look at that source from 1920. Um, you also want to consider, has the information been revised or changed? Are you looking at the most current version of the information? Um, is there a newer edition? Where can you find that newer edition? And if there's a web page, is the if it's a web page, do, is the page maintained? Do the links still work? Do they, when was it last updated and can you even tell that information? Um, which sometimes you can't and sometimes it's sort of hidden. You need to go into like view source and check the metadata, but as we know, not everybody keeps up the metadata. <laughs> um, the R stands for reliability. Is it supported by evidence? Is it verifiable with other sources? Um, are there references or other sources included? So can you compare it to other sources or are they the only source saying this? And if so, why are they the only source saying this? Um, is the content peer reviewed and who's it peer reviewed by? Um, what kind of content is it? Even if it's appearing in a peer reviewed journal, it might still be an editorial or an opinion piece or a letter. And those have less validity than a fully blow in research study. Um, and are, are the methods documented? And importantly, are the methods appropriate? Now, one of the areas that I would strongly consider paying attention to for are the methods appropriate is statistics. Um, a lot of times people just punch numbers into SPSS and aren't using an appropriate statistical test. So do try to pay attention to that. Um, authority. So that's what the A stands for. So we've got CRA. Um, so who's the author is or the creator? Uh, what are their credentials? Are they qualified to write about this topic at all? If it's a paper about quantum physics, are they a quantum physicist or are they a psychologist? Those are, a psychologist is very set up to write about psychology, but not quantum physics and vice versa. And again, there are areas where that might be relevant. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you're really interested in the psychology of quantum yeah. physics. Then a psychologist would be a perfect Yes, yeah. and, and you can certainly, have more background knowledge than your strict degree applies, but do take a look at that. Um, who is the publisher or sponsor? Um, and are there any conflicts of, inf of interest? So are they receiving money to say good things about this drug? Um, for example, uh, are there advertisements on the website? Um, this one's a little bit of a gray area. Uh, some of the best journals in some of the other fields I pay attention to do have advertisements in them, but that's just because they don't have any funding. <laughs> um, and then there's another one that's where is the information hosted? Sometimes you can tell some information from that, um, but a lot of times that's just in theory when it comes to websites. So for instance, .ca is supposed to be for Canadian websites, but it actually just means the server needs to be in Canada and the website, the person writing the website can be from anywhere. But there are certain ones like uh, government websites you do have to be affiliated with the government in some way to have a governmental address. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're of the highest quality. 
Um, and finally, the P stands for purpose or point of view. Is it fact? Is it opinion? Or is it propaganda? Is it trying to sell you something? Does it have a bias? Um, either a political ideology or ideological, religious, personal bias? And how would that influence the work if it would influence it at all? And when you're reading it, do you have a bias and is it affecting how you view their potential bias or not a bias? Um, and an important one here too is why was this resource created? Uh, so that's the crap test, that's sort of the simple, quick and dirty, is this any good, should I be looking at it at all sort of thing. Yeah, and that kind of test can be applied to any source, mm -hmm. including in areas outside of medicine. So if yeah. you want to look at, okay, is this news, is this fake news? Yeah, so speaking of fake news, uh, we've got this talk here, or this uh, slide here, which are, there are many other tests that are similar uh, to the CRAP test. You can find more of them online. There are even variations of the CRAP test with extra A's or extra R's or extra P's. Um, one of the ones that we have here from the from IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations um, and Institutions, which is an organization that we're fairly fond of, um, they put out this how to spot fake news pamphlet. So some of the things we've already talked about, consider the source, read beyond the source itself, check the author, uh, check supporting sources, check the date, check whether it's a joke. Unfortunately, some people think things from The Onion are or the Beaverton are um, accurate news, which they're not. Uh, they've got here specifically, check your own biases. Um, are you just believing this because it aligns with what you believe? Um, and ask the experts. Um, and then there's also the important consideration right now of fake news, which is real news that is not no, this is not a good way to word it. There's fake news and then there's people that, or there's news that people say is fake that they just don't like. Um, so also be prepared to distinguish between those two things. Um, look for credible news, whether or not you like it. Um, so now we'll move on to some tools and techniques that are a little bit more advanced and uh, are also focused on um, internal validity. So I'll let Nicole take over here. All right. So these tools are more focused on what is actually in the article that tells you whether you should trust it or not. So we're not looking here at external sources, we're looking at mostly what is actually in the article, what does the article say, does what the article say make sense, and does how they came to that conclusion also make sense. So one of the tools that we look at for this is a checklist. There are a whole bunch of checklists out there for everything under the sun from systematic reviews, guidelines, randomized control trials. So these are different tools that you can adapt for your own critical appraisal. And they're especially useful if you haven't really done critical appraisal before because they really lay out, this is what you look for first, then this, then this, then this, then this. Also can be really helpful if it's a resource type you're not familiar with. If you always focus on clinical trials and you haven't really messed with the systematic reviews very much, uh, looking at an appraisal checklist specific to a systematic review can really help you figure out what you should be looking for in figuring out whether this is a valid source. So we're going to go through a one specific example for a systematic review, and that is the CASP checklist. So CASP is an organization out of the UK, and it's uh, the Critical Appraisal Skills Program. So this is a really neat checklist that's freely available. You can take a look at this anytime and use it again and again for different articles that you're looking at, but it goes through different steps that you should look at when you're considering whether a systematic review is valid or not. So first off, you start with section A, are the results of the review valid? Did the review address a clearly focused question? So if you have a review that is on the topic of what works good for mental illness, that's probably not a very focused question. You can think about focus in terms of population. So maybe you want to focus instead of all of mental illness, just kids with depression, for example. You can look at interventions. So instead of what works good, Let's maybe focus on SSRIs. And instead of looking at what is works good in the context of an outcome, you can consider, okay, uh, what reduces suicidal ideation or what improves quality of life? So the question, are SSRIs effective in improving the quality of life for kids with depression? That's a much more focused question than just what works good for mental illness. Uh, you also want to consider, did the authors look for the right type of papers? 
So if you're looking at a clinical question, particularly one that's an intervention or a drug, often you're going to be wanting to focus on clinical trials. So if uh, the author did a review of editorials on their topic, that might be super interesting, but it's probably not the best choice for considering the best answer for this clinical question. And if you find that you've looked at these two questions and the answer to one or both of them is no, just stop there. <laughs> if it's garbage at that point, you really don't even need to go any farther. It's just this isn't even worth your time to keep looking at it. But assuming you've decided it is worth your time, do you think that all important relevant studies were included? Or do you happen to know that there's a really key study in your field that wasn't considered by this for some reason or really should have been? Did the review's authors assess the quality of the included studies? So if you're looking at a systematic review on the association between autism and measles and there's Andrew Wakefield's paper in there, there might be a problem. And if the results of the review have been combined, was it reasonable to do so? So if the authors are looking at everybody with depression, for example, and they combined kids and adults and the elderly with depression and just put one, is this drug good or no? That might not be as valid as if they considered those groups separately. So maybe what works well for children doesn't work as well for adults or vice versa. Or in terms of the intervention, maybe not all SR SSRIs are equally good for depression. Maybe this one is good and this one maybe has some side effects that are negative and this one maybe doesn't work at all. So you really want to consider, are they comparing apples to apples? Are they comparing things that it makes sense to combine together and then look at across different interventions? And then you want to look at what did they actually find? Did they actually find that uh, drug X is a good drug or did they not find that? Did they actually find that there's enough clinical trials out there to have a valid answer to this question or did they not? And also how precise are the results? Uh, so do we say that SSRIs are great or do we say that SSRIs are great in situation X and they provide uh, outcome Y? So you really want to consider how precise the results that the authors have come up with are. Then you really want to consider, okay, that's great. They have a result. Um, is it really relevant to me in my local context? So if you have this great systematic review that's perfectly valid as far as you know, and it's come up with the ideal treatment for seniors with depression, and you work in a pediatric clinic, maybe that's not the most relevant systematic review you could be looking at. Were all important outcomes considered? So if you're interested in quality of life, but also reducing suicidal ideation, and this review only looked at quality of life, it's useful still, yes, but maybe you need something more to go with it. Finally, are the benefits worse, the harms and costs? So if this drug provides 5% benefit of quality of life in half the population and kills the other half, probably a bad drug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a balancing scale, right? Most things aren't that obvious. So if it provides great benefit for 9 out of 10 people and then the other 1% has a reduced quality of life, is it worth it? Maybe, maybe not. It kind of depends on what you're considering there. Same with cost. If this drug provides great benefits for everyone who takes it, but it costs a million dollars, is it worth more than this drug that provides pretty good benefits for most people, but costs $100? Again, it depends on your local context, it depends on what sort of considerations you want to put in place and what your sort of balance in that consideration will be. So the same organization has a whole bunch of different checklists for all of these other study types. And if you're looking at a different study type other than a systematic review, we definitely recommend checking those out as well. Yeah, and CASP talks about having education sessions, but those are only available to people in the UK. Um, so. We're sure they're great, but we live in Winnipeg, so. <laughs> right, here's another example of a systematic appraisal tool that you can use. It's called AMSTAR 2, and it's the second version of the AMSTAR review. It's a validated appraisal tool for systematic reviews and observational studies. And it's basically just 16 questions that you answer yes, no, or sort of. Uh, the more of these questions you can answer yes to, the better the validity of this uh, systematic review is. So did the research questions and inclusion criteria for the review include the components of PICO? That's population or problem, intervention, comparator, and outcome. Uh, that's the basic foundation of most clinical studies. And did the research question that it's looking at consider those different options? So some of these that we've already talked about, some of them maybe you'll have to look a little bit more closely at the methods section to figure out. 
For example, did the review authors perform study selection in duplicate? So did they have one author and also a second author looking at these studies to see if they should be included in their review? Did they describe the included studies in enough detail? Did they uh, perform a satisfactory uh, statistical analysis of the studies that they included? That was something that Maureen talked about. So you really want to go through these questions one by one and do a close reading of the methods section of the review to figure out whether the answer to these questions is going to be yes, sort of, or no. And again, the more yeses, the better. Yeah, it's not necessarily a case of you answered no to one and therefore the review is garbage. Um, Correct. It's a, it's a spectrum. It's a sliding yeah. scale. More yeses is good, but one no is not going to be the end of the world. Yeah. Um, There's a whole bunch of other checklists out there that you can definitely take a look at, and we're going to be going into where you can find these very shortly. Yeah. Um, we're also going to do a quick run through of some guideline appraisal tools. Now, guidelines are one of those areas where there is a lot of variation in the quality. Um, so I would strongly suggest if you're if you're absolutely crunched for time and you're trying to decide which things you need to do an assessment of more than others, I would recommend making sure that you appraise your uh, guidelines. So one of the guideline appraisal tools is the Agree To, um, which is put out by the Agree Next Steps co uh, Consortium and stands for Appraisal of Guidelines for Research and Evaluation Two. Um, and it's available at this website here. Um, the document itself is 57 pages long, so we're not going to go through all of it. Um, and uh, it includes a guide for how to use and how to assess. So some of what we've talked about here um, with the systematic review, but in much, much more detail. Um, so I highly recommend reading through it. Uh, the tool addresses uh, six key areas. So scope and purpose, stakeholder investment, rigor of development, clarity of presentation, applicability, and editorial independence. And you'll notice that those sound very similar to a lot of the things that we've been talking about previously in this um, webinar. Um, Just to mention, you don't need to worry about scribbling down the URLs practically. We are going to share this presentation later. Yeah, yeah and uh, we'll be sending the slides out to the people who um, registered. So if you're here, you'll be getting the slides in your email as well, which we'll have. I mean, you can just copy and paste them from the slides itself. Um, also, if you do a search for like agree to guideline appraisal in Google, this should come up. Um, so each question or each section of this has several questions under um, it. And each of those questions has a Likert scale from one to seven. So again, it's a spectrum, how good or not good something is. Um, and again, I, I do really want to emphasize that guidelines can be very, very variable in okay. their quality. Um, yeah, if it's an organization that you know and trust, great, their guidelines are probably fine. But there certainly are guidelines that you have no idea what they're based on. You have no idea, for example, what the stakeholder involvement was or the rigor of development was. It just seems to be put out by some sort of health organization. You have no idea what's gone into it at all. Um, as with the systematic reviews and the other things, there are other checklists. Um, one of the things, so we've we've got one here for assessing clinical practice guidelines, and as you can see, it's much simpler than a 57-page document. Um, so it's got very, you know, straightforward. Clin uh, is the clinical question clear and comprehensive? Is it recommended? Is the recommendation recommended intervention clear and actionable? Um, but one of the things when you're looking at checklists, do appraise the checklists as well. Um, this one, for example, I would say is, is not as good as the Agree tool. Um, I would say that it doesn't consider some of those concerns about uh, stakeholder involvement and rigor. It's um, a bit vague. Yeah, it's, it's quite vague, actually. Um, but we're coming close to the end of our time, so we will move on to where you can find more information on on this topic of critical appraisal. Yeah, absolutely. And again, these slides are going to be shared later, so don't worry too much about copying down all of the links that are on the next slide. Uh, but we're going to be talking about if you are looking for a critical appraisal tool for a particular study type or for looking at your uh, research in context, uh, these are the different places that you can go to get it. 
So there's the CASP checklist that we've already mentioned. Uh, there's the Joanna Briggs Institute of Critical Appraisal Tools. They have a great set of tools that work for different kinds of research. They also, interestingly enough, have a tool for opinion, which is really helpful if you are wanting to look at an opinion-based piece and try to tell whether it's something you should be considering as valid or not. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's very important to consider in areas where there's not a lot of content and you may have to rely on uh, opinion-based pieces. Right, so in areas where maybe there haven't been the RCTs that you would like to see yeah. on the topic, there haven't been any systematic reviews, okay, what is there that I can look at that might give me some information that will be helpful? Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration, Cochrane's an uh, organization that's really focused on systematic reviews, but they've got, uh, as part of their methodology, they've actually developed this tool for assessing risk of bias in randomized trials. So that's considering, okay, how likely is it that this randomized trial has been impacted by something that shouldn't have impacted it? Like, do the authors have a conflict of interest? Are there other issues involved that might have resulted in bias in the trial? And finally, the Duke University Medical Center Library has a great set of resources on evidence-based practice appraisal. So I definitely recommend checking those out. They've got a ton of different checklists that you can look at that will be helpful for you. Yeah, and again, do consider your needs and your available time when you're getting into critical assessment. Do it as much as you can, um, but if you don't have the time to do it in this detail, make sure you do something. Um, then there's also the NCCMT Learning Center. So that's the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. They have a series of a critical appraisal modules that walk you through how to do each of these sorts of critical appraisal. So each one is a, uh, an hour to a couple hours long, so you do need a decent amount of time to be able to go through them, but they're actually super helpful in helping walking you through this process and they go into a lot more detail about some of these issues than we do, so I definitely recommend checking them out if you do have that time available to you. Yeah, and if anybody's wondering, the national is is Canadian, it's yeah. not some other organization. Um, Oh, so this is me talking about this now. Uh, so a quick summary of what we've talked about. Uh, in general, critical appraisal is important. It's important for research. It's important for practice. Frankly, it's important for your life when you're watching the news, when you're reading something that is supposed to be factual. Um, so do make sure that you're engaging in critical appraisal. And you know, when you're watching the news, you probably don't need to whip out your checklist and just uh, start marking things off. But, but you can if you want to. You can. Um, I feel like that would be depressing. But <laughs> um, uh, and there are many tools to help you out. Uh, some are simple, others are more complex. We've talked about and linked to a couple in this presentation, but there are others out there. If you're looking, if you want a tool that's for some sort of study type that's less common or that's not common in medicine or something like that, there's probably a tool out there for it. Um, certainly you can have a look, but do make sure that you're assessing how good the tools are. Now, some of them are validated. We talked about one validated tool here. Um, many of them aren't. Or beware. Yeah, yeah. Um, and even if you're using the tools, you don't necessarily always have the skills or the confidence to be critically assessing something, especially if it's outside of your area of expertise. So with any of this stuff, uh, do feel safe asking other people for help. We're people who can potentially help, though we of course have our own limits on what our expertise is. Um, so don't be afraid to ask an expert in the field um, that you're specifically looking at. Um, don't be afraid to seek outside opinion or even just a second opinion to say like, you know, I think this is a good source, but I have very strong opinions on this topic. Maybe it's not a good source. Maybe I'm letting my own internal bias influence uh, what I'm looking at here. Um, and again, this is a huge topic. There are a number of other learning resources out there, not just the tools themselves, but those resources that we've linked to, um, other webinars and um, things like that from various organizations, perhaps even some of your own uh, organizations that your members of send out notifications on this that may be more relevant to your specific field. Um, so if you're feeling like this brief half hour introduction hasn't been quite in the depth that you need, you can certainly find more out there. Um, so that's it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we'll stick around for a little bit. Um, again, I'm Maureen. I'm Nicole. And 
we're just going to mute ourselves while we wait and see if there are any questions. And uh, if not, then we'll log off fairly soon. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. All right, so it doesn't look like there are any questions. Um, if there are, and we've cut you off, unfortunately, we can't see if you're typing or not, but um, feel free to send us an email with any follow-up questions and we'll certainly respond. Um, once again, we'll be sending out the slides later today and the video will be going up tomorrow, uh, most likely. Um, so once again, thank you for attending and uh, have a lovely, lovely rest of your day. Okay, end webinar. Um, okay, end webinar for all.